Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. My name's Kevin Graham. And I'm Paul John Dykes. And today we're with the author Martin Geraghty. Welcome How you to going, the show, Martin? Martin. Thanks very much. Great to be here, guys. So, Martin, the first question that we always ask guests on a Celtic State of Mind is, how did you end up getting a Celtic State of Mind? What's your Celtic background? I uh, just ran the family. For most people, I think it's their dad that begins with, but for me, it was my two brothers. They're maybe between seven and ten years older than me, you know, so they used to take me along to the games. Most of my first kind of memories are like maybe mid-80s, early 80s, you know, it was a cracking time, you know, and especially the European nights in the jungle on the on mm-hmm. the barriers, you know, yeah. it's brilliant memories. Where are you from? Where, 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 where did you travel to Celtic Park from? Uh, I was brought up in Sunny Drum Chapel. Uh, used to get trained through to Belgrove and uh, make my way along. And uh, we, always, we always ended up in the jungle. It was where we always watched the games from. Interestingly enough, just a couple of weeks ago, we were chatting to Frank McGarvey. Yeah. And he was talking about the jungle and how important the jungle was to him as a player. Um, and he only felt accepted when they accepted him, didn't he? Yeah. When you look back, there's a romantic notion that football was better back in the day, Martin. What's your take on that when you go to the Celtic games now? I'd have to agree. I don't know if it's an old man thing, but as you get older, I think most things always seem better in the past. Music, some telly, you know, but definitely the football was different. You know, was, I loved the fact that it was, in the days, it was loads of homegrown players, you know, watching like McStay and that, you know players are like that uh, so the football is maybe a better standard now I would I think but the actual experience of going to a game I loved it you know the hustle and bustle and getting through off the barrier and then ending up in a monster pile of men's legs and then the, well, I mean, it was chaos you know but it was brilliant it was exciting you know uh, so uh, I'd say the actual experience of going to a game in the past I preferred Mm-hmm. And who, who were your heroes back in the 80s? Big Aitken, Big Feed the Bear, Davy Proven. I was at that Scottish Cup final. I was in tears when Stuart Beattie opened the scoring for the United. 13, greeting my heart out. Wasn't he meant to be like that, you know? I was going one down. I'm Paul McStay, definitely, and a maestro. I liked to be Andy Walker as well. Some, he scored a good few goals for us at that time, you know? Controversial statement now. Ah, I don't like him as a person, but as a player <laughs> back then, you know? And he wore fancy. <laughs> Fancy boots, kind of mind the main of them. And then Dick Annie obviously loved him. My brother actually ended up with his Pantoforo Doro uh, football boots, so he did. The gold ah, ones? The gold ah, ones. He worked for Tell us the story of that. Aye, brown story actually. Um, he worked for USC in Argyle Street, which was owned by Tom Hunter. Tom Hunter used to always buy uh, the boots of cash for kids and all that, right? That's right, aye. Aye, and um, the girl that my brother was going out with was down in Ayrshire where he lived and she, uh, you know, they were uh, friendly and that and he gave her the boots. She then gave them to him and, um, I mean, I don't even know why he had them at this, this day, right? But my oldest boy, um, he's, uh, he, he's 17, but when my, my daughter, um, she's going to be 21, um, when I found out their mum was pregnant, we were in a pub in Shettleston celebrating, and he was standing in the pub town tavern with the Canio's boots on, <laughs> drinking, <laughs> and people were all crowding around like, yeah, it's not good to Canio's boots. He says, I'm showing him the signed signature and everything, you know, it was bonkers. I don't know if he still got them at this day, but it was just, you can't make it up. I, ho- a, I hope he's kept them. I, I, so they are. Now, we're, we're talking about your Celtic memories. Mm-hmm. We're also here to speak about your book Aye. that you very kindly brought along with you. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us how you got into writing and how you created this this book that we've got in our hands here? I've always been a really keen reader. I'd rather read than watch a telly most of the time. Uh, so I used to go along to uh, the I Write Book Festival at Mitchell Library and uh, just like uh, see some authors that I wrote books that I really liked and two years ago I noticed that they were doing a creative writing thing for like two hours or something it was so the guy there that does that David Pettigrew uh, he's a lecturer in uh, creative writing at Strathclyde Uni he I went to two wee courses for two hours you know it was, it was enjoyable but I didn't think anything more of it you know and people say yeah, it's like a cliche but sometimes a book a book finds you or a story finds you and I didn't do anything with the writing, didn't write a, a single thing. And then the MP Joe Cox was murdered. And it was around about the time of the Brexit vote. And there was loads of anger and everybody was 
you know, they're going to vote what way it was going to go. And um, I read about what happened in the guy's childhood who murdered her. And it just kind of, it, it went from there. His mum ran away with an uh, Afro-Caribbean man and left him to be looked after by his grandparents. And that sowed the seed of racism. He ended up, you know, uh, total fascist. And the idea that somebody can let just one child instant, uh, incident affect the rest of their life, the story just came for that. So the person that you're referring to, Connor Boyd, Aye. how did you create that character? So, so that was it. The, the, the story was, right away, Connor Boyd just tried to think, took myself back to growing up in Drumchapel and what it was like, the crazy kind of characters, the things that went on. And then it was just a case of making each chapter show how his behaviour escalates after this one childhood um, incident and how he, almost like a snowball, his, his behaviour's just getting worse and worse and worse. And the first part of the book takes you up to, it ends when he carries out a, a kind of violent attack and his family need to move away. And then the second part uh, picks up when he's um, just about coming to 18. I think it's a wee bit more light-hearted because he goes about doing the kind of things that 18-year-olds do and moves into a flat with his mates in the West End of Glasgow. So it's set in Glasgow. Loads of people recognise the, you know, the locations and stuff like that, you know, which I think people quite like that. But when you started writing it, did you have a publisher or was it just a case of...? No, when you just, you've never had any experience of writing, I'd never been to uni or nothing, you know, so you mm-hmm. don't know where it's going to go. But I got to a certain point and then I got advice to go to, like, spoken word things and speak to other authors and immerse yourself in all that. And I would read chapters from the book and I got brilliant feedback. And I thought, you know, and this was from published writers. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, at that point, you might have a chance. But everything you read leads you to think you won't get published. Mm-hmm. It's it, it's made out like the Holy Grail. Aye. It's incredibly difficult to get published. And there's a lot of snobbery. I mean, people, like, the first thing they ask when you're a writer is, are you published? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's one thing about it. I, I, you know, I didn't like, you know. But I finished the book and read the first chapter at a spoken word thing in Falkirk. And a woman called Helen McKinvin, who's had two books published, made a few comments to me about it. And um, I had a wee nagging doubt about the book in the back of my mind. And I had wrote it initially in the third person perspective. Mm-hmm. And it was nagging away at me and I ended up starting it again, <laughs> wrote it in first person. So I had to write the book completely again. again. I changed it all to, And it made it more you know, personal, you get really into his head and... As you were making those changes though, did, were you realising this is the right thing to do? Oh you know, aye, this, aye. this is a, well, a eureka moment, this, oh, uh, this is working now. Aye, yeah. as soon as I started the first couple of chapters, I've, I always loved Catcher in the Rye as well and it, it's almost as if when you write it in first person, you almost feel as if you're there with them. Mm-hmm. You're in that room, you're on that train with them or whatever, you know. And it, I it just elevated it, and then I was like a lot happier with it, you know. Mm-hmm. And I sent it away to maybe about five publishers, and then um, one of them get back to me pretty quick. And the first kind of hurdle is you send three chapters, and if they ask to see a lot of it, you know, that's a, a real positive sign. You know, everybody says that's. That's brilliant, you know, to even get to that mm-hmm. level, you should be happy with that. Uh. But you know, you're greedy, you, <laughs> you want it all, you know. So um, they then asked for the lot of it, and then I got an email on a, one Sunday morning telling me they wanted to publish it. And it just it was just an amazing moment, you know. I was driving to get my boy, take him to football, and I drove the wrong way along the motorway. <laughs> you know, my head was scrambled. Yeah, yeah, I was, was just, aye. So two people I know were published to them, I asked them if they were good to work with and if, mm-hmm. you know, it was a good place, they were going to treat you well and stuff, and um, they, they, they they said that, you know, I should go for it, so that was that. That's an amazing journey for you standing up and uh, uh, would have been behind the wall in Falkirk, you would have, you, you would have, you would have read the... No, I had, no, my, lo- I had my launch party in there actually, oh, but uh, the... 
uh, there's a wee spoken word thing that's on the first Saturday of every month, and anybody that's writing or thinking about it, I would advise them to go there. It's a place called Cafe on Wear Street. Right. And they have a wee uh, bit up the stairs every first Saturday every month, and the standard is brilliant, and the people are so supportive. You need to find somewhere where you feel comfortable uh, reading your stories to people. Mm-hmm. Because some places I went to at first were quite cliquey and, you know, weren't very friendly or that, but you go to a place like that and it's just brilliant. Yeah. I still go to this day, you know. So it's a great wee place. So, Martin, you were talking about other aspects of writing that you were unaware of, you know, spoken word events. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned earlier that you got to know Chris McQueer through through one of these events. Yeah. So when I was writing my book... I was really oblivious to all of these different things that went on and I caught a YouTube uh, video of Chris at his first ever um, reading in public and um, it just blew me away. I thought it was hysterical. I absolutely loved it and it made me then start writing a couple of wee short stories like with a bit of humour instead of, you know, the book was quite a dark book in places. And the second one I went to, Chris was headlining it and I read a story which he really liked and he asked me then to read at his uh, book launch, the launch for Hings through in Edinburgh, which was a brilliant opportunity, you know, everybody needs a wee help in hand and that made the world a difference to me, it gave me that confidence as well, you know. Uh, so it's been amazing to see him transform and, you know, the way, the, way, the level he's got to now, you know, he's... It's absolutely amazing to, to see, and he's such a, a great guy as well. It's a great story. It is a great story. He's a, He's been very good to us on the podcast, and especially our launch night a couple of weeks ago, he was fantastic. Yeah. Really, really, really good. Have you got a setting project in mind? Are you writing an R book? Yeah. Is yep. it the same sort of process? Are you going to do a bit of spoken word to see the sort of feedback that you get? And what's that about? If you can I've, tell us. Or if, aye, it's... It's always hard, I think, to explain what your book's about. You know, you kind of get a look as if, is that it? But uh, it's it's really about an old boy in his 70s and um, see how old people are so kind of can be fixed in their ways. And when they get something happens, it changes that, takes them out of that environment, how they kind of struggle to adapt Mm -hmm. and how, you know, the world's changing dramatically, you know, and for older people, it must be really difficult to adapt with everything like technology and everything else uh, so he forms a, a, he's be, he was quite reclusive and he's formed he forms a kind of special wee relationship with his care worker uh, so I'm about 35,000 words into that so far wow. uh, so it's it's been a lot more difficult to write than uh, I mean polluted mm. it just seemed to fit Pieces all seem to fit dead easy. It came dead naturally, you know. Mm-hmm. It's a wee bit more difficult, but it'll be worth it. Definitely. Is the same publisher interested in publishing it, or is it just... No, I, I didn't have a great relationship with the publishers, uh, to be honest. Um, so I'm going to write it and then send it off to other publishers. And I've got a lot more experience. I know what to look out for and, you know, what kind of publishers I want to work with uh, next mm-hmm. time, yeah. So, fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. I think initially to get that opportunity and get started, it's always good, but you, you're always learning. Uh, when you mentioned publishers, Tom Campbell, who's in the room, and I both looked at each other because obviously we've both had experiences <laughs> like that. Mm-hmm. But now you're in control of it a wee bit more. You're, as you say, more experienced, and you'll be confident that are they the right fit for you yeah. rather than the other way about now? Like I said, it seems it gets made out to be the holy grail, and you feel like, wow, I've got a chance to get published, and you take it. And I, I did do a wee bit of homework and I got positive feedback, but the publishers are actually winding up in like a year and a half's time because that will have been them 10 years and it was almost as if they'd kind of fallen out of love with it. They didn't share the same passion and it's a tough business. I was I worked for myself self-employed and I was it was affecting my own day job. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was putting in like half a day's work, like trying to market it and... I wasn't in social media until I got published. Then I had to start all that, you know. And it's it's a, it's hard hard work, you know. It's like starting a new job. Everything seems great, and then you kind of scratch below the surface, and some things happen. But because you're new to it, you just go along with it. You don't know any better. Mm-hmm. This time I will know better. You will know better. Like right. the editing and everything for the beginning, it, it was it wasn't great, you know. The 
the level of support and stuff, but you can just learn and move on, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, you recently had a situation, Paul, where a publisher was looking at one of your books and they weren't going to read it before they printed it. That's right. They weren't even going to proofread it. Oof. So, obviously, we uh, didn't sign the contract on that one, but I think yeah. you do get a wee bit more confident and a wee bit more sure of yourself, uh, you know, after the first couple. Mm-hmm. But uh, what I was going to ask, you've mentioned Catcher in the Rye, what other kind of influential books or, or authors were you were you into yourself? There's a German author that um, called Hans Falada, and... Um, one of his books resurfaced recently and um, they published it and then since then they brought out all these books before that but th- th- this book is called Alone in Berlin and the characterisation and, and it's absolutely brilliant you know and the actual story you know they're all set in Germany kind of Weimar Republic period and everything you know but it's all stories about people and the dialogue's brilliant. That's what I love. I just love character and dialogue, and that's what I brilliant. try to write about. You know, that's what interests me. People, how they react to situations, what makes people tick. You know, so I mm-hmm. uh, Hans Flader and uh, the book I read recently that I absolutely loved is um, Memorial Device by David Keenan, and it's uh, about all these group group exactly. of characters that are in uh, music and they're in Airdrie, and it's about being a punk in Airdrie and. I think the, the kind of tagline for it was it, it's hard uh, being like Iggy Pop and Airdrie. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? And it's it's wrote with such humour. It's absolutely amazing, and uh, it exploded. He's done amazing. I think his second book's out in January. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm always interested to know the methods the writers as well. And I, I remember reading about Irvin Welsh. If ever gets to that stage where he's looking for a bit of inspiration, he'll jump on a train and he'll just make observations and he'll mm-hmm. write them down. And as you see, he'll be able to feed that into characters. I work during the night. That's how I work. Are you, is there any quirks? Paul or you... will send you text messages at three o'clock in the morning. Uh-huh. Uh, normally, when I'm working at, at seven. <laughs> so, <laughs> is there any wee quirks that you've got as a writer? Well. I think you need to get a routine of some kind. And my routine was, for the first book, was um, I got my boy to bed and then for nine o'clock, you like one o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning, I would be writing until I was got to a point where I was satisfied with what I'd, what I'd written. And I just kept that going and kept it going. It's different. My kind of circumstances have changed with the second one and I'm just snatching time here, here and there and everywhere, you know. So, but I know what you mean about that, what you're saying. Like, see, since I started writing, I've noticed that when I'm going out places and I went up Conic Hill a couple of weeks ago and going up there and I'm looking at stuff and I'm getting ideas for short stories and all this, you know, and I've written one and just sent it away there uh, just from a, a trip up Conic Hill, you know, it's strange how it kind of starts consuming you, you know. Mm-hmm. Every does, experience aye. can become an idea. Aye, and, every you know. person you meet, mm-hmm. a wee trait of theirs or whatever, you know. No, it's really interesting. We've, we've had Chris in, and Chris says sometimes he doesn't know where they come from, it's just conversations and that that, that they have. Obviously, you're quite passionate about football. Mm-hmm. Have you ever thought about basing writing about football like a story of? that involves going to games so and it happens in the book games or like to be honest I didn't think about it but your good self read the Tommy Burns one wasn't it? Ah that was me yeah. Aye and I was I absolutely loved that cause such a soft spot for Tommy Burns and um, I loved the passion of that you know and there's definitely got to be something in that because for me you've got to be passionate about what you're writing about mm-hmm. if you're passionate about Celtic you definitely something there that you could do aye definitely I think sometimes you read or you hear people and if they're no passionate about something they get found out ah, uh, uh, aye, uh, there right. are some guys that you hear talking about stuff and you go you're mm-hmm. going to get found out here if yeah. you're not passionate about mm-hmm. it yeah. and I have read some stuff especially books I'm not going to name any names but there's a book that's out just now that's getting absolutely slaughtered uh-huh. and the guy has got the music industry completely wrong Mm-hmm. And there's folk who are reviewing it mm-hmm. who are musical journalists gone. This is absolute rubbish. Mm-hmm. You'd never researched what you were yeah. what you were writing about. You just didn't have you just didn't do the work. Yeah. You just didn't have the you, you had an idea. Yeah. But you, you need to have that passion. You need to, to have do. that passion. Ah, and that's and what that drives knowledge. it, isn't ah. it? Mm-hmm. It's like we were talking about Richard Ashcroft last night at the Barrowlands. Ah. His new album's getting absolutely slated. But 
he does he does what he, he does his what music he does. with a passion. He's got such a passion for it. He believes in it, you know. And that for me means means a lot, you know. He might not all get it, get it right. He might be four or five good songs out of ten in the album, but the four and five are worth anything more than your typical uh, yeah. pop star of the day, you know. Now, mm. That's one thing about Richard Ashcroft's solo albums. They have been patchy. Yeah, definitely. They, they have been patchy, but if you would have asked me a week ago about the one that he's got out just now, mm. I would have said it was a turkey. Aye. I would have said, I just, I just can't, I just can't get that at all. Mm-hmm. But now it was the other day that I was humming son, and I'm going, where's that tune for? I can't remember. And it's the first song on the album. Aye. So, so it's sort of one minute's way. Yeah. And songs that I never got before, mm-hmm. I'm now going. That's actually, mm-hmm. that, that, that's got a great melody. That's that, that's catchy. Aye. Find but, the same. Yeah. You spoke about the Barrowlands. You, you have wrote a short story about the Barrowlands. I did, eh? aye, aye, aye. Didn't aye. aye. It was great because I get the email saying I was getting published and um, I think it was like two days later I did a gig at the Barrowlands uh, where I was going to with my daughter mm-hmm. and um, it was brilliant to be taking her there because I remember one of my favourite gigs ever was two weeks after she was born and it was in the Barrowlands and it was um, the Verve when they brought out Urban Hymns Sunday uh, night. I, I think it was a Sunday night. Aye, I was it. And aye, and uh, you know she was only t- two weeks old, and then she was now eighteen. And I was taking her to her first gig at a Barras, and it was two days after I get published. You know, and it was just amazing, and it just you know f- felt compelled to write something about it, and I wrote about how special a place it was and mm-hmm. everything. And mm-hmm. David Ross, that wrote yeah. um, the Last Days of Disco trilogy, mm. he complimented on me on it, and. Um, I ended up from that brass neck and asking him to write the wee puff for the book. And uh, he was amazing. He, he, he agreed to meet me. Uh, we met in Waterstones near Gale Street. And uh, such a nice guy. And, and he said, ah, one of my mates is coming in. Uh, he'll be in a few minutes. You, you know Bobby Bluebell? And I was like, ah. Remember watching them and talk to the pops that like, Bobby <laughs> Bluebell? Bobby walks in, shakes, man, how you doing, Mark? And I was like, you know, surreal. He got Bobby Bluebell to record a single for one of his books, didn't he? Know? He did. He did, he did, he did he? Uh, well, he's got he's got a band, uh, the Mirac- the Miraculous Vespers. Uh, I wait, I seen them actually because I went to the launch of his last book yeah. down at the Dick Institute in right. Comalic because right. he's from there. Because uh, I went down there and gave him a the, the copy of that to uh, read before he put his name to it, you know. <laughs> uh, I, and they had the band there playing a couple uh, of the songs. Well, I seen the Vespers at the Admiral. Did you? Aye, aye. 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 And, uh, right. I'm not sure if it was a, a concept before it was a band or the other way about, but it did appear in a book. Yes. And it, when you read the book, it's almost a fictitious band. I yes. Think, I think, having a look at, uh, I, I don't know Dave, day, but having a look at his social media, there seems to be a lot of things, when he comes up with an idea, there's a playlist. Yes. There, 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 there's like ah. certain songs that it, that's got to influence what he's actually writing, and I think, I think the Bobby Bluebell thing was, I need this band to have a song, mm-hmm. and I need somebody to write the song. So the did. miraculous Vespers were Vespers, born. Aye. One thing I spoke to Chris about it. My second book was adapted into a feature-length documentary, right. and Chris sees his work perhaps evolving and becoming adapted into TV, film, etc. Is that something that you've considered about your debut? Do you know what? I think it'd make a cracking programme, like an hour long or something, you know, say, somebody like Ken Loach or something doing it, you know, because it's a lot it's to do with issues today, you know, mental health, you know, class issues and stuff like that, you know, so that'd be a dream, but just glad to get it get it published, you know, and anything else that happens. It's a bonus, isn't it? But I could definitely see wee Chris doing... He'll be in BBC, BBC Scotland. He'll have a, he's in show or something soon. I haven't seen the clips, uh, those wee videos at the Grovner, you know. Some of the stuff that's on BBC Scotland, co- masquerading his comedy, couldn't hold a light to the stuff he was doing. He's got a knack. As you say, he transforms when he's on the stage. When he starts reading his own his own work, he's hilarious. Ah. Now, we're talking about passion, and the problem that you mentioned earlier, Kevin, was I didn't feel the publisher had any passion whatsoever for the book I was going to release. Mm-hmm. We've all got a passion for Celtic. So mm-hmm. if we bring that right up to the present day, what's your thoughts about this season and some of the issues that we've experienced? I get myself into a lot of trouble uh, Twitter and that for my thoughts. Hence you know, why you're sitting with a microphone in front of you. <laughs> because um, 
I, I, I despair at some people's opinions and, and things. Like, I was listening to uh, Off the Ball on the way in, and, and there was a Celtic support roll on, and Stuart got, Cosgrove asked him a brilliant question. He says, would you rather get it up Rangers, or would you rather your club improves their image in um, Europe by getting better results? And the boy was frank, says, I'd rather get it up Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... You know, I'm like, I want, I want more than that. You know, like, I don't think we should, should be paying Brendan the mega bucks. He's on just to dominate domestically, and titles won. We know even Rangers in the league. I know you can only beat what's in front of you and that, but I just wish we'd perform better in Europe. It's, it's a sorry state. Like, I used to love the Champions League nights. There when Nakamura scored that free kick, and we got through the last. 16 and then gradually it seems as if the kind of financial chasm you know now and it's no it's no good going to watch your team getting beat 5 nothing at home in Europe and stuff but Europa League I think we should be competing better than we are Well we spoke about it all last season how you know there, there was this line that Celtic are a Europa League team mm-hmm. I, I think we've been unlucky getting Leipzig as your pot free team was a shocking bit of luck Red Bull the other the other Red Bull cousin Salzburg semi-finalist last year I, this year I, I managed to watch them against Red Star Belgrade and they should have put Red Star Be- Belgrade out they should have been out of sight against Red Star Belgrade they should have been about 5-6 nothing up 5 minutes of madness they went out and away goals and when when they arrived in their group I had folk going like they're for Austria and I'm going they're better than us and one of the worst things when we got beat in Austria, I, I was thinking to myself, I was going, not one Celtic player would get in that Salzburg team. Mm-hmm. And I'm including Kieran Tierney in that. I says, that's a shocking state of affairs. It really is. And you look at Leipzig, it was, they sent out a reserve side against mm-hmm. us. Yeah. And I fair play, we had a good 30 minutes, usual Celtic in Europe. It's been the same. I've been watching Celtic over 30 years. We lose a goal then collapse. Mm-hmm. Game plan out the window, and um, we're hanging on. And you're going, this is what always happens. Do we expect anything else now? Are our expectations too high? We've got 33 first-team players. How many of the first-team players have started under 10 games for us? Mm-hmm. And you're expecting guys like Kouassi to come in and actually do a job for you. It doesn't work. I just think that we kind of make, we're making a lot of excuses. Like Brendan's coming out and saying, these teams are Champions League quality teams. You know, and, and then... We're bringing guys in that he's bought. He bought Kouassi. He bought We Morgan, who I, who I like, actually. And they're coming in and they're not doing a job, you know. And it's, I mean, I know he's not played in such a long time, but the mistakes he's making, he should be able to cut a ball out and straightforward mm-hmm. ball out if you've, even if you've not played for 10 weeks or whatever. You know, it's basic stuff. Poor goals to lose. and mm-hmm. It's a massive uh, step up for Morgan, though. Champion, aye, it is, uh, Scottish uh, Championship last year well, straight into the, Europa League aye, and it's definitely but the likes of Kouassi's three million of course isn't yeah. it I mm-hmm. mean you don't I, I don't like the way we make some people scapegoats I think sometimes you, you need to realise that we've no bought players that are going to enhance the team no definitely and I think one of the big things is no talking about players we've bought the level of the players that made as a team we were two years ago have really dropped and then for their form to dip so much, it makes a big, uh, you know, impact the it team. Does, there's a natural, there's a natural drop off with players, and our squad is now getting to that natural drop off. I think losing Armstrong, Dembele, and Roberts, we tailed off at the tail end, the, the, the end of last season because Armstrong and Roberts were, were injured for the most of the season. Mm-hmm. They made the difference. They can commit players against pack defences, mm-hmm. stuff like that. The thing with Kwasi. We signed Kwasi when he had only played 18 first team games. That's right. That's a big gamble. And Russia. Aye. For a team. Kras- Krasnodar or Aye. something like that. Krasnodar, yeah. Aye, strange. But I mean, we're talking about Europe and that's fine. Do you think this challenge is real domestically? Depends on us. If we go, if we get back to end like the, the way we can play, no. Was it the, Ath- the Athens game and it were so predictable they, they defended well but it was just everything was done slow just passing from one side of the park to the other and I thought we could have played, we should, we should played have all night Athens. oh we should have we should have bet Athens Aye. over the two legs and you, you forget and all of it they went down to 10 men for a good 25 minutes still couldn't break it break them down 
I think it's all down to us. If we if we get back to form, we'll win it. You know, be more than ten points. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And finally, Martin, what does the future hold for you in the short term? The short term, getting this book finished, and it's you can only improve. You know, do your best to improve. And I want to write a story with the same amount of passion as the first book, but technically better. That's what I'm hoping to do. And I think I'm getting there so far with it. With regards to mine polluted, I'm looking at options at getting it republished with uh, someone else because I'm still getting like um, messages in social media and that still, even though it's not been available for a couple of months, uh, for people who have read it, like saying, you know, your book deserves to get read by a lot, a lot more people. Like you should try and do something else. Yeah. This has been Martin Geraghty with a Celtic State of Mind. Thank you, Martin. Thanks Thank very you. much. Fans Bet are a new online bookmaker who promise to share 50% of their net profits from tagged accounts for causes that matter the most to fans. The business is about fans and run-by match-going supporters, and we at a Celtic State of Mind are delighted to be partnered with them. If having a bet is already part of your match day and something you enjoy doing on football, racing or any sport, then you can download the Fans Bet app to sign up. If you do so, then please select Celtic as your club and a Celtic state of mind, and you'll be making a contribution to keeping your podcast going and supporting other Celtic causes. They've already helped to make a difference to the fan community by contributing to fanzines, supporter trusts, branches with travel costs, and they were also part of the first safe standing installation in England at Shrewsbury Town. You can visit blog.fansbet.com to read more about that, on their Giving Back page. All of our podcasts, articles and videos can now be found on intocreative.co.uk. This site encapsulates our love of Celtic, music, books, film, politics and much more. Pay us a visit, check out our shop for merchandise and contribute your working ideas to the site. As always, thank you all for listening. Join us again next week where we will have another guest with a Celtic state of mind. We'll be right back.